Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that this week's episode is brought to you by my new online course, Become a Superhuman. And yes, it sounds exactly like the title of the podcast, but this is actually an online course where we go into the various aspects of improving your health, specifically your endocrine health. More specifically, yes, more specifically, getting your testosterone up to the optimal levels. Now, whether you're a male or a female, as we've learned in numerous episodes of the show, testosterone is the ultimate feel-good motivation, improved health, improved fitness, improved body composition, super drug, okay? So everything from your mood to your recovery time and everything in between is affected by your body's endocrine health. And what my team and I have done is we've actually taken years of my own self-experimentation, years of research, every possible literature and study we could find, and we've condensed it into a simple three to four hour program that you can follow along and make simple, safe, and easy adjustments to your lifestyle to improve your endocrine health. Now, as listeners of this podcast, you can get a very special discount by visiting jle.vi slash T. That's jle.vi, just like my name, slash T for testosterone. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's show. You guys, today we are joined by one of the world's most renowned fitness trainers who has worked with some of the greatest names in Hollywood. He's trained UFC fighters, celebrities, and police academies alike. He's also a spokesperson for Gold's Gym, a writer for Muscle and Fitness and Train Magazine, and you might even know him as the host of Celebrity Sweat on Spike TV. Now, in this episode, my goal was to gain a clearer understanding on the world of fitness training and muscle development uh, and see really how it's changed since I was a teenager, a college student, trying to, you know, put on a few extra pounds. But in reality, I actually got much, much more than I was expecting during this interview because my guest today is literally the person behind some of the most incredible physical transformations in Hollywood. The ones where you see an actor in one movie and then you see them in the next movie and you don't even recognize them because they've changed so much from a physique perspective. So my mind was definitely opened up to a whole new realm of possibility. Now, in the episode, we talk about diet and nutrition and exercise, just like we do in a lot of episodes, but the difference in this episode is that we really talk about the extreme end of the spectrum. The three degrees of separation, if you will, where people's bodies can be radically transformed in a matter of weeks or even days in many cases. So we then tie it back in with some practical tips that you can use to do the same to create the body of your dreams, whatever that might mean. So we get into the weeds, we get a little technical, we start throwing out some technical terms, but I know you guys will keep up and I just know you guys are going to love absolutely love this episode. So without any further ado, let me present to you, Mr. Eric, the trainer. Eric, the trainer, welcome to the show, my friend. I have to admit, it's a little bit weird calling you Eric, the trainer, but as I understand, that's what everyone knows you as. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on the show. My real name that I grew up with is Eric Fleischman, but as soon as I became a fitness professional, people started calling me Eric the Trainer, partially because I would call to make appointments, I would call to confirm appointments, I would return phone calls, and people would say, Eric who? And I'd say, Eric the Trainer. And they'd be like, oh! And so it, it started in a very practical way, and then people started repeating it back to me with a funny accent like, Eric the Trainer! And I was like, okay, they seem to enjoy saying my name. So I can assure you that everyone calls me Eric the Trainer. My son calls me Eric the Trainer. And actually, if you went up to Arnold Schwarzenegger and said, hey, I'm friends with Eric Fleischman, he would look at you in a confused way. But if you said, hey, I met Eric the Trainer, he would absolutely know who that is because I train his son, Patrick. <laughs> no kidding. How cool is that? Yeah, he's an awesome kid and really growing up in a super way. 
Amazing. So Eric, I was surprised. I looked on your bio and obviously I saw a photo of you and then I saw something kind of with a dissonance to your bio, which said that you grew up as like a scrawny 98 pound weakling. So I'm dying to know, like, what are your stats and measurements now just before we get into the whole life story? You know, uh, it's absolutely true. I grew up not only a 98 pound weakling, but I grew up exceptionally small for my age. I was living on a farm in Maine, which is pretty remote. And uh, it's kind of cool to live out in the wilderness, but it's kind of a drag to be super little, especially when all the girls that you want to go on dates with look like they could be your babysitter (laughs) rather than your girlfriend. So yeah, I was very small for my age, but it all works out as they say. I'm now six foot one. I weigh 235 pounds and uh, feel very confident from a physical standpoint. But the great thing is that, remember, I'm a trainer and trainers are in the service industry, like a great waiter or a great hairstylist. And so part of understanding your clients' needs and desires is also understanding their perspective. So many, many, many cases that we have people need to gain muscular size. Guys come in to see me who are not happy with the way they look and I need to build them up into this incredible, powerful person. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the few trainers that can do that, but also who has true perspective. I remember what it was like to be that small and it's a drag. And so (laughs) to take someone from normal to extraordinary is something I really take a lot of pleasure in. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people kind of wonder what you ate and what you did and all that stuff. For me, given kind of what I do and the learning aspect of kind of my day job, I'm wondering how you go from being 98 pounds to being the expert. Like, how did you learn so much about bodybuilding and fitness to become one of the experts that the experts go to? Well, I I learned it in the best way you ever could, and that is I lived it. So I found myself in college, very slight and with a desire to change. And I went to the gym. And luckily, for most of you that are listening out there, if you find yourself in that situation and you go to the gym, usually there are some experts or at least some enthusiastic bodybuilder types that will recognize you being there and they will try to help you out. And sure enough, I went to the gym and there were some guys there that sort of took me under their wing and showed me some of the basics in a friendly way. And uh, it was kind of like being a mouse befriending lions. You know, I I could easily pull a (laughs) thorn out of their paw if they needed it. But they were really nice to me. And as I started to grow taller, I was lankier and lankier. So first I was short and normal, you know, proportion. And then all of a sudden I grew and I was tall and super skinny. And that was a drag too. So they sort of taught me the importance of eating and uh, showed me some basic exercises. And it really made me fall in love with the fitness process. Knowing that someone who is less than stellar can walk into a gym and physically transform themselves and emerge as a hero. To me, that was just so cool, so captivating. And it harkened back to the days of the comic books because I grew up on a farm in Maine. We didn't get a lot of television stations. So I grew up reading a lot of comic books. And to see those heroes save the day with their incredible physiques and their great ethics, I just love that world. And so this was sort of a piece of that magic that could exist in our world today. So... I uh, moved to New York City. I got certified as a trainer. I started working and realized very, very quickly that my desire to deliver a high level of result to my clients did not exist. So I hadn't been taught through the certification agency how to be a great trainer. They taught me anatomy. They taught me physiology. They taught me the name of the muscles, but they didn't teach me how to take a woman who was frustrated and five foot four and 200 pounds and turn her into a bikini model. They just sort of taught me about what muscles were there and what exercises she could do. So Mm -hmm. I set out with all of my might to create a system that would help take women and men from normal to extraordinary based specifically on what they wanted to accomplish. It wouldn't be my agenda. It would be theirs. And like a great chef in a kitchen, I would first listen to them to talk about what they wanted, and then I would implement my skill set. And that's one of the biggest missing things in today's fitness world is trainers using their ears to understand in a best case scenario what the person would want. Because If you were my client, I'm looking at a picture of you right now. I see you with glasses. You look terrific. If you were my client and you walked into my office and said, Eric, I'm here. I want you to transform me. It's kind of like saying to a chef, hey, I'm here. I'm ready to eat. You need to find out what that person wants. In your case, as I'm looking at your photograph, you would have three distinctly different options. As a good trainer, I would articulate those options to you first before we did anything. The first would be, 
I could actually make you look a lot more like Bruce Lee. I could make you smaller and leaner, sinewy, explosive, chiseled, shredded, Mm -hmm. and people would think that you had just emerged from the game of death. I mean, it would be so cool. (laughs) That with a few uh, karate kicks, you'd probably end up at a local dojo. The second option you would have is I could make you look a lot more like Tarzan. And for those of you out there that are listening that have seen the movie recently, you know that Tarzan has broad, powerful shoulders, a very small waist, has great physical relevance, but has more of a natural, sleek physique. When you look at Tarzan, you don't understand if he did that in a gym, if he swims 12 miles a day, what's going on. And of course, it gives you the great advantage to learning how to fight lions, which is just great conversation (laughs) at a party. Um, And then the third option is, you know, you might say to me, I want to be big. I want to be the Hulk. I want to be a guy that's exploding with muscle mass, who as he gets out of a car, intimidates the valets. You know, that's something I could definitely deliver to you. So there are three distinctly different options. Most people get together with a trainer and they just jump into the workout and whatever happens, they figure that's their destiny. But actually, that's absurd. I mean, when was the last time you got into a taxi cab, sat down in the back and said, drive? Never. You always tell them where you want to go. And so we really instruct our trainers and I myself always listen to, in a best case scenario, what would you look like if I had a magic wand from the Harry Potter series? Boom. Tell, to describe yourself to me. Right. And based on that, we bring them to that destination quickly, effectively, and in a fun way. So what are the differences between those three body types? I mean, how do you arrive, I guess, at the different body types? I mean, is it as simple as high rep, low weight versus you know, low rep, high weight kind of thing? Not at all. No, it's completely different in every aspect. Remember, the science of change, the way that we change physical bodies, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you want to be big, medium, or small, we use three elements. The science of change is exercise, diet, and sleep. Specific exercise based on the result that you want, Mm -hmm. and all of the exercises that we would have in those three different cases would be completely different. Diet would be absolutely different because, as you can imagine, Bruce Lee and the Hulk, when they go to lunch together, never order the same food. And uh, (laughs) the only thing that would be the same is sleep because of those three, exercise, diet, and sleep, sleep is the most important. Sleep is the only time the body can transform All physical transformation occurs exclusively during slumber. And because of that, a lot of people don't realize that. So because of that, a lot of our top actors and actresses have to prioritize sleep during the transformation process. For them, it's a real education. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious. Let's say I want to go with this big hulking bodybuilder type that you mentioned. Yep. What's the protocol? I mean, how does a skinny 98-pound guy go to being 200-something pounds besides, of course, the height increase? I mean, what's the protocol look like? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to realize that there's going to be a lot of eating because we don't use any weird, strange supplementation at all. We use food, we use exercise, we use sleep. So we would absolutely begin to shift your diet to more of an aggressive eating style, specifically in the animal-based protein and water-based carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. We'd also throw in some grains in there. But I mean, the eating that you would have to do would be quite extensive in order to deliver the raw material that I would need to build out the lean muscle mass that we're looking for. It's funny you asked for that one because recently we had two interns come in from Chicago who happen to be best friends. They're both seniors in college studying to be professional trainers. And when they arrived, The plan was that they would study our method and shadow us for two weeks. And then the second two weeks of the month, they would work with clients themselves, but also I would put them through a transformation. And Mm -hmm. so it turns out that one of them needed to go up 20 pounds in muscle, as we're discussing. And the other one had to shoot 20 pounds of fat straight down in order for them to sort of meet at a place where they appeared as trainers. And it was incredible because looking back on the experience, this great young intern said to me, you know, looking back, the workouts were a blast. It was so fun hanging out with you. The hardest part was eating. I mean, he basically walked around Mm -hmm. for two weeks, virtually nauseous at all times (laughs) because we were just packing the food in. And anytime he wasn't holding something to eat, I would put something in his hand, even in the gym. So he was always eating. It's kind of like Glenn Gary, Glenn Rossi, they say ABC, (laughs) you know. He was always beating. It was crazy. Yeah, I remember way back. I actually had uh, a customer who was like Mr. Olympia or something like that, totally by chance. And one day I came to him with, you know, the typical hard gainer, like whiner behavior. And I was like, I just can't gain weight no matter what. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Eat this every day. 
and then tell me if you don't gain weight. He's like, I'll pay you a hundred bucks if you don't gain weight. So I just remember standing in front of the refrigerator every night and being like, oh my God, like I've only eaten 60% of what I have to eat, which means I need to do all this now before me <laughs> just like hating my life, you know, like so much eating. It becomes a job and it really, it's quite challenging, but you will grow because, you know, if I was a, a chimney maker and you wanted me to build a big, beautiful chimney, no matter how incredible my artistry was, I would need bricks. Right. So as a trainer, if you want me to build a beautiful physique for you and you want it to be large, I need you to consume food. It's incredibly important. But yeah, we help guys grow all the time. We help men and women shrink all the time. You know, we get these movie scripts in and based on what the character says, we make the body Wow. Incredible. I love it. It's like designer body styles. It really is. And don't forget also, I live in Hollywood. I don't live in Des Moines. We get days, not weeks or months to change wow. these people. I mean, I have no learning curve. You realize most trainers have a chance to sit down with clients, get to know them. They set up a relationship with them. I literally get some random guy who sits down in my office and says, hi, my name's John and I'm leaving for Toronto in 11 days to shoot a movie and I need to be giant help. Wow. And so it's like a 911 call. I spring into action. I make one phone call. All their food is delivered instantly by a delivery service that we use based on our specifications. We exercise with them every single day and it's just a race against the clock. It's very, very cool. So what are the outer limits? I mean, I know Tim Ferriss has this like blog post that went viral about, you know, 38 pounds in, I don't know how many weeks, three weeks or something like that. What's the outer limit? I mean, on a protocol like this, how much mass can someone put on how fast? Right. Well, that's a great question. To answer that question accurately, I have to remind your listeners that bodybuilding is the art of illusion. So sometimes when I have only 11 days to take a guy that looks like a normal guy walking down the street and turn him into a gladiator who's closer to the Hulk than he is your local mailman, mm -hmm. part of it is my ability as an artist to build specific muscle points on his body to give the illusion that he gained 30 pounds, oh. when actually he might have only gained eight but I can put eight pounds on a normal body in a way where you swear that he gained at least 20. Wow. And so it's really, I consider myself much more of an artist than I do a physical fitness <laughs> practitioner. You know, there are sculptors that work in clay. There are sculptors that work in stone. I just happen to work in bodies. You know, I, most of us have a female friend who has a beautiful face and you think, oh my goodness, if she only lost weight, she'd be a knockout. I'm the one guy in the world that you know that can actually take her and make that realized quickly and effectively. Wow. Wow, that's totally cool. It kind of reminds me of Arnold's like pumping iron thing where he's like, you know, if I want to put on one millimeter on my biceps, then everything else has to go because it all has to be designed in such a way. It all has to be proportional in such a way. I always thought that was such an interesting approach to the human body. Well, he was onto something because there's such artistry when you get to the highest levels of physique changes. I mean, it's based on physical beauty. Right. Because so many men and women focus on weight and measurements and inches and all of those things. But actually, if you and I were going to a party together and we're driving there tonight and I turned to you in the car and said, hey, how much does a beautiful woman weigh? That's absurd. I mean, you wouldn't be able to answer that because if you and I went to a shopping mall together right now, I could point out women that are 120 that we find unattractive and I could point out a woman that weighs 155 that we both want to make out with. So beauty is actually something that's completely within the individual. And so we analyze the individual, we look at the task at hand, and we create something that everybody universally would agree upon is the answer. Brilliant. So Eric, I want to ask you, you know, back when I was well read on the topic, when I was a scrawny, you know, 120 pound guy, the name of the game was high weight, low rep. And then of course, like we said, the tons of food, but using fixed axis machines to focus on individual muscles, you know, you have your bicep day, your chest and tricep day, that whole thing. I'm wondering how the thinking has changed. I mean, as far as the exercise component of it goes, what's really at the cutting edge of muscle building these days? The cutting edge is something that's brand new and it just got released through my book, but we've been using it for years. It's based on the method I created. The name of the book is Hollywood Muscle and we have some proprietary exercise technique, some of which has been around for a long time and no one's ever spoken about it and some of which we discovered recently. But the big three things are 
rather than using fixed machines to deal with individual muscle groups, we actually do something that's really simple. And that is in a lot of exercises, we use a false grip or what they call a monkey grip. So Mm -hmm. rather than grasping a bench press with your thumb wrapped around, we actually do a thumbless grip where it's sort of resting in your hand. What that does is it takes the secondary muscle out of the equation and allows me to communicate directly with the primary muscle. In that case, it would be your chest. And by doing that, we can expedite the changes because I'm dealing with one specific muscle. The second thing we do is something called jet reps, which is a huge thing. And that is, your listeners must realize that in every motion, there's a primary muscle and a secondary muscle, which supports. And with jet reps, there are limited range of motion repetitions. And so all of the focus and intensity of the exercise of the weight remains only in the primary muscle. We divorce the secondary muscle from the exercise. So once again, using the bench press as an example, when you're underneath a bench press and you lower the bar down to your chest, as you push up from touching your chest halfway up, that is all pectoral. Mm -hmm. From halfway up to arm straight, that's primarily shoulders and tricep. So what we do And what Arnold did actually in Pumping Iron is we bring the weight all the way down, we touch the chest, and we drive it only halfway up, about four inches. And by keeping that limited range of motion, the tricep is out of the exercise and all the focus and drive and intensity remains within the pectoral. This causes an unbelievable change within the chest. And actually, we're at the point where we can grow the chest out towards you or we can grow it sideways based on what you need. So usually we grow the chest on a normal guy sideways. So in the end, the result is two huge high dinner plates that are up on the torso in a very high place. And it looks great. It contrasts with a very small waist. And then the third proprietary thing that we do is something called the engorge phase. And that is directly following every set of uh, exercise that we do. We have about a 10 second squeeze or clench of the muscle. So, you know, in the bench press case, we would do our jet reps with a thumbless grip. And as soon as we're done, we'd put the weight back, we'd stand up, and then we would straighten our arms, make a fist, and twist the wrist in towards itself. And we would squeeze the pectoral muscle, contracting it as hard as we can, and we would hold that for 10 full seconds. What that does is it actually summons blood from other parts of the body to race into the muscle, thus allowing it to get all of the nutrients of all the good food you've been eating, and it actually makes you grow twice as fast. That's really, really interesting. It sounds like really cutting-edge stuff. Yeah, I mean, we take guys that really need to change in days, not weeks or months, and we fulfill that destiny. And we use the fall script, we use the engorge phase, we use jet reps all the time. Very strategically, as we work, like any great artist, we look at our work and we decide, okay, this is working, but this needs a little more help, and we make the adjustments. And in the end, when the person steps out of our gym, people in the outside world go crazy. Yeah, I bet. So let me ask this. I mean... This obviously is a protocol designed, like you said, for emergency situations where someone needs to completely transform their physique. Is it also something you would recommend for someone who wants to be an all-around, balanced, kind of fit person, or it's really designed for you know, dramatically changing your physical physique? You know, it's for both. What it is, is it's a way to expedite results. It's a way to get faster results, exactly what you want, quickly. I mean, My big issue with the world of exercise today is that it's only exercise. Exercise, you know, the world of fitness today is kind of like religion. You know, you put in your time and you hope for the best. And we can't afford to be like that in Hollywood. You know, when a normal guy goes to a gym in Kansas City and goes through a bunch of different exercises and then wakes up two months later and looks a little bit different, he figures that's his lot in life. That's the result of the work he did. You know, maybe he's a little thicker, maybe he's a little broader, who knows and who can control that. Those odds are terrible. And we don't have the luxury of having that kind of relationship with chance. We need to specifically make decisions beforehand and strategically achieve those results quickly. I mean, when a normal person sits down in my office and tells them what they want to do, I can basically describe what they'll look like in 12 to 14 days before we even start. Wow. What's the most dramatic transformation that you've been involved with? Wow. Well, let me preface that by saying I've been a trainer for 25 years. And most of that time has been spent working with actors and actresses. So we've had some crazy befores and afters. I bet. I mean, insane. 
everyone from working with Kirstie Alley, who found herself way, way, way overweight, and we helped her wear a bikini on the Oprah Winfrey show, to working with a guy named Ethan Supley, who he started out at 650 pounds. And uh, if you saw American History X or Cold Mountain or The Butterfly Effect, you, you saw him larger. And we needed to bring him way down. So we brought him down to about 287 with no cardio for a show called My Name is Earl. Oh, yeah. And we're currently working with him in a completely different capacity now. We're teaching him stick it Filipino stick and knife fighting right now for a new show he's doing with Hugh Laurie, who was on a show called House. They're shooting a new show right now in San Francisco. Cool. But I mean, we've worked with everybody. And I'm actually working with Tom Welling right now, who was uh, Superman in Smallville. Did you guys ever see that show? I have to admit I didn't. Oh, yeah. It was a wildly popular show. And it's kind of cool to work with Superman. I mean, it's like, yeah, hey, I bet. that's awesome. And uh, no matter who it is, whether we're working with a superhero or we're working with someone who plays a prisoner of war, we constantly have to shoot people down or bring them straight up. I mean, you can imagine the look on my face when a very handsome, muscular guy walks into my office, an actor that we would all recognize, fantastic guy. I'm so happy to meet him. And he says, hi, I just got a role playing a POW and I need to go down to 135. And he looks incredible at 195. Right. I mean, so sometimes I have to undo the work of others to fulfill the dramatic role. But all of it is such a fun challenge. And I feel really lucky to be able to do it. And uh, I do it every day, seven days a week. Incredible. So, all right, say I come to you. I'm like, hey, man, currently I'm, I don't know my weight in pounds. Let's say I'm like 165 pounds. Five yep. foot, nine and a half ish on a good day. I want to weigh, I don't know, like 190 pounds of sheer muscle. Like what does my week look like? How many days a week am I lifting? Stuff like that. I would probably see you three days a week for only one hour. You would need to allow me to control your diet. We would want no traditional cardio at all. And you would also need to allow me to control your sleep, especially if you wanted to gain that kind of size. We would need you to go to bed much, much earlier because the hours before midnight are worth nearly twice as much as the hours after midnight from a transformation standpoint. Oh, wow. So we really would want you to go to bed at 10 and wake up at 6 rather than going to bed at midnight and waking up at 8. There'd be a visual difference. And I think that'd be easy. I mean, I think you, you just described the easiest case of my day. I deal with some hard cases. I mean, I deal with some <laughs> unbelievable challenges. And it'd be super fun. It'd be a pleasure to do that. So just let me know. Come to Hollywood. We'll have a blast. Yeah, I need to do that. Next time I'm in LA, we should definitely do that. And I assume, you know, the rest of the strategies for those who can't take you up on that generous offer are in your book, I would presume. Tell me a little bit about the book. Well, we're so excited about the new book. It just came out. I was in New York doing some promotion for it, and it's selling really well on Amazon already. It, it's just it's an exciting notion to share our method. Awesome. Remember, it took me 25 years to come up with this method and really hone it the way that it is, and it really works, and it's very effective. The way that we present the material also is a lot of fun. I wrote the first part of the book as a comic book, so to see the backstory of where I came from and to explain some of the complicated physical fitness methods that we utilize, we did it all in comic form full color comics. So uh, it's kind of fun to read. And then all of the exercises, the specific exercises demonstrated with jet reps, false grip, the engorge phase, all of the photographs in the book are full color because I don't like fitness books that are black and white. Right. And every single exercise that's in the book is articulated through a video. So there's a QR code next to every single exercise. If you download our free app from the app store, the Hollywood Muscle app, you can actually swipe the QR code and instantly the video will pop up on your phone and it's me explaining and demonstrating the exercise with the person that's in the book, in the picture. So there's no disconnect there. Brilliant. I'll be on your phone and you could just put the book down, bring your phone to the uh, gym and you could uh, work out with us. Brilliant. So let me ask you this. I'm a big CrossFit guy because frankly, I can't motivate myself to do, you know, any traditional cardio like running or swimming. So I really like that, you know, I'm throwing weights around and stuff like that. What's your thinking on uh, CrossFit and how would you potentially improve it? Well, here's the thing. They always say there's different strokes for different folks. I can't tell you how many concerts and movies I've been to that are critically acclaimed that I actually, it's not that I don't like them. I just don't get it. <laughs> like uh, somebody gave me front row seats to Radiohead at the Hollywood Bowl, which were the most sought after tickets, you know, a year or two ago. And I actually gave them to a client because I, Radiohead's a good example. I just don't get it. You know, there are certain things that appeal to you and there are certain things that you're like, 
interesting, but it's just not my cup of tea. Well, CrossFit's one of those things. I'm not a big CrossFit fan only because, first of all, exercising in the way that CrossFit exercises sort of leads towards injury. And there's extensive, I mean, it's just a fact, there's extensive injury in the CrossFit world. I mean, it's been a renaissance for chiropractors. They've right. never been busier. But also the notion of putting in effort to exercise without any kind of visual results, which would give you, you know, specific happiness, you know, because not everyone wants to look the same way. I mean, CrossFit is exercise and there's nothing wrong with exercise, but I'd much rather be able to select exactly how I'm going to look and how I'm going to feel because that will lead directly to my confidence. I've seen men that do CrossFit that look like they've never worked out a day in their life and yet they're quite successful at CrossFit. And I've seen guys that are very muscular who do CrossFit and they seem to enjoy having that kind of presence. But ultimately, you know, if you think about the world of fitness as a line graph, so imagine this, there's a line in front of us. On one side of that line is far away from the other side as possible on one far, far side. Those are people that need to be in shape for their jobs, military, police officers, professional football players. And so something like CrossFit for them would be perfect Mm -hmm. because no one cares what they look like in their underwear, but they need to perform tasks at their job that require physical prowess. And that is amazing. And that's where I like CrossFit. As far away from that side, as far away as you can get from that on the other side of the spectrum, that's where I live. I live with bikini models, Hollywood actors. We use fitness as a tool to transform our bodies. We don't exercise for the sake of exercise. But like I said, there's nothing wrong with exercise. It's just not necessarily something that we're involved with. But I can tell you that some of the CrossFit guys did challenge me to do some CrossFit exercises. And because of my bodybuilding abilities, I was able to do some of the things, but it wasn't the most enjoyable day in my life. So Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean... When somebody knows that they look and feel their best, they're more confident and they can achieve the things they want to achieve in life. And so we, like I said, use fitness as a tool to transform the body, to deliver what they want. So it empowers them to be the best. Right. So, okay, that's fair. And I think that's a fair indictment. I mean, the two biggest criticisms are, yeah, if you're not really paying attention to form, you don't have a coach watching you like a hawk. There is an increased risk of injury when you're doing fast paced, you know, weight training, Olympic lifting. And also, yeah, there's definitely a culture of like, who cares what you look like? There's no intentionality about creating the body that you want. It's like, get through the workout faster than anyone else and whatever muscles develop as a result develop, you know? So I think those are definitely fair and I can see the merits of potentially combining the two different approaches. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you something. I would fully embrace CrossFit if someone enrolled me in a mixed martial arts fight. Like if I got a call from the UFC and they said, Eric, bad news, you're going to have to fight Anderson <laughs> Silva in a couple of weeks. I would call you and say, hey man, can I come to your CrossFit class? Because I need to get stronger and more explosive. I mean, there are places in the world where CrossFit really apply. If I suddenly joined the military and I needed to get into shape for that, I think CrossFit would be dynamite. If I joined the police department, I think that would be great. I mean, CrossFit has a great application in a lot of things. It just happens not to be at all valuable in Hollywood where I live. Totally fair. So let me ask you this. You mentioned, I mean, of course, carbs are a factor, especially when you're consuming that level of calories. You mentioned high water carbohydrates and a little bit of grains. Talk to me a little bit about that because I know, you know, we've had Jimmy Moore on the show. We've had a lot of keto experts, a lot of paleo experts who are very anti-carb. So why are the carbs important and what are high water carbs? Oh, I think what I said was water-based carbohydrates, yeah, which are fresh is. fruits and vegetables. There it is. And, uh, What they do is it's not just the fact that they give you energy and that they're water-based. It's that the darker colors of the water-based carbohydrates, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, really ruby red tomatoes, they're very high in antioxidants and they help Mm -hmm. increase your beauty quotient. So if you're a guy who needs to become more muscular because you're going to be on camera, one of the ways that we can make you better looking is through the consumption of water-based carbohydrates that have a darker color than others. So if one guy ate bananas and potatoes and the other guy ate berries and red tomatoes, the one who ate the berries would look much more handsome. Right. And those things really show up on camera. I love that. And also, I think it's worth noting that all the berries, they're low glycemic index. I mean, they, they have some sugar, but they're not like a mango or a banana that's just going to shoot you through the roof you know, in terms of glycemic load. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
we don't allow any of our women to eat bananas, potatoes, or corn because they're starchy carbohydrates and they tend to thicken them up. We instead want them to eat those berries and you know stay with things that are darker in color. Why the women specifically? Because we want our females to be sleek and feminine, elongated, strong and powerful, but still stay sleek, feminine, and quite beautiful. And so we don't want to thicken them up. I mean, if a bunch of Little League football players came to see me, I would make them eat bananas, potatoes, and corn along with protein. But when it comes to women, many times we're called upon to sleek out normal-looking women. Interesting. And it, just to clarify, because I know someone in the audience is going to be outraged if we don't, sleek out does not mean like ribs showing and, and anything like that. What's kind of the going body fat percentage that female models these days, I mean, in the kind of after all the outcry, what's happening with that? <laughs> yeah, we don't actually do anything based on body fat percentage because I find women that are too thin to be really unattractive. And as an artist, the best I can do is actually create beauty in the image that I can imagine. And so, um, we try to just help normal women become the most beautiful version of themselves. Sometimes that involves them losing a little bit of weight. But when I talk about sleeking out, I'm talking about specifically having a long, beautiful, elongated femininity and posture. I mean, sometimes we work more on posture and poise than we do are actually losing weight. Interesting. So yeah, I mean, I'm with your listener. I'm not into skinny girls. I think a lot of those models that are super skinny look terrible, especially in real life. Boy, yeah. I mean, they might oh, yeah. look good in pictures, but you see them in real life and you're like, that woman's like really, really way too thin. Yeah. We had a uh, Brad Pylon on the show or was it Brad Pylon or, or maybe it was Abel James who was saying, you know, just because they have abs and they're smiling on the cover doesn't mean they don't hate their life all the rest of the time because it's really miserable to keep your body at, at that state all the time. Absolutely. I mean, if your listeners imagine the girl next door, that's kind of what we go for. And she's not a fitness model. She doesn't have washboard abs, but she's just a beautiful, natural, young woman. Right. We help women sort of become that version of themselves. I love that. I think that's the healthy approach from a psychological standpoint. Absolutely. Absolutely. Eric, I want to ask you, we talked a little bit, I mean, obviously animal-based protein, really big factor. We talked about the carbs. Where do you stand on fat? I mean, it seems like a higher fat diet is so trendy right now with, you know, the keto world and the paleo world. And also I assume, you know, people who are coming to you are needing to eat thousands and thousands and thousands of calories, which is much easier with the nine calories per gram of, you know, high quality fat. So where do you stand on high fat diets? You know, we embrace it. You know, for us, it's just a means to an end. I think a lot of your listeners and a lot of people out there in the greater world get caught up in the minutia of macronutrients and fat and weight and inches and all of those things. And we actually look at all of those pieces as grains of sand on the beach, but we're much more into the beach. And so, hmm. you know, certain foods are a means to an end for us. If I want a guy like you to grow bigger, I ask you to eat beef, I ask you to eat dairy. I ask you to eat whole eggs. If I want a guy like you to maintain the physique that he has and maybe look a little bit more like Tarzan, I ask him to eat chicken breast and turkey breast. Mm. You know, and once again, you could have eggs for sure. If I want a guy like you to actually lose muscle size and muscle weight and look more like Bruce Lee, to really sleek you out and hone you down, I would have you eat exclusively egg whites, tuna, and uh, wild-caught salmon. Interesting. Literally, we see these foods as a means to an end. I mean, salmon, wild-caught salmon is a great example of a food that's very high in fat, but it helps me sleek you out. Right. Down. We're much more focused on the end results than we are on, on the little tiny, we don't go crazy along the journey. We love the process, but we don't obsess about the journey. I love that. I think that, again, that's the psychologically healthy approach here. Eric, I want to ask you a little bit about sleep because, you know, as you said, it is the most important piece. You gave us one really amazing tip that I actually didn't know in all the episodes that we've done about sleep, which is, you know, sleep before midnight counts double. Are there any other cool sleep tips or weird hacks that you think can help people with that all important repair piece? Absolutely. Like I said before, of the science of change, exercise, diet, and sleep, sleep is the most important. Because sleep is the only time that physical transformation occurs, if your goal is to transform your body and your life and your mind into something that's new and more evolved, you have to prioritize sleep like you never have before. Now, there are all kinds of sleep tips I could give you. Have a nice for mattress, keep the room cool, Mm -hmm. and dark. Stop eating food at least three hours before you go to bed. 
So you're going to sleep with no food in your stomach. Like there's a million things I could tell you about that. But imagine this. Imagine if five kids playing out in the yard and they can't wait to eat chocolate chip cookies. So you and I go inside and we desperately take all of the ingredients, mix together the greatest cookie batter. Can we feed that cookie batter to the kids? The answer is no. We have to put it in the oven first. That's where it transforms into those hard, crunchy things that little kids love. And then we can bring them out to the kids. For you to work out with me, arguably one of the better trainers in the entire universe. And for us to hire Wolfgang Puck himself to prepare the diet that I would give him to make the food exactly the, what it needs to be, it wouldn't work. You have to sleep. Right. Sleep is the only time. So my advice to your listeners is please prioritize sleep, especially during transformation. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's so important that it does bear repeating. And, you know, I think so many people get that thing wrong and they think, you know, I'm working out so damn hard and I'm eating so damn much and I'm just not gaining. And then you dig a little deeper and you're like, well, you're sleeping six hours and you're waking up in the middle of the night because you drank, you know, a liter of water before. Right. And then the whole story falls apart. (laughs) Men and women that sleep more usually are better looking. There is such a thing as beauty sleep. And so if you want to increase your good looks and good health, get extra sleep. And then when you wake up, look in the mirror. Absolutely. So Eric, you said no supplementation. Is that absolutely no supplementation? I mean, no creatine, nothing like that? We do our work in an all natural way, specifically because with HD cameras nowadays, if anything is off, if you've taken creatine, if you've taken protein supplements, protein powder, shakes, if you've taken vitamins that are kind of weird, your body reacts to that usually by getting puffy. Mm. And if you're puffy and you're on camera, it's disaster. It really can throw off your look. And remember, these roles are so competitive. Every time you see someone on television or in a film, there are hundreds of people that wanted to be in that role. Right. So you really have to keep a balance of good looks to stay on top. Or you literally, you won't work because there's always someone that's slightly more talented or better looking that's right behind you trying to nab that role. So we do our magic without supplementation. Of course, Personally, I advise people to take a multivitamin. Mm -hmm. I advise people to take an omega-3 fatty acid. I advise most of our male clients to take BCAA, branched-chain amino acids. Extra vitamin D as in dog, extra C as in car. I mean, there is some basic supplementation, but no creatine, no glutamine, no L-arginine. Like We don't use that stuff. We're not working with bodybuilders. We're working with the most watched people in the world, right. and that is people that are on camera, and they need to be a very attractive version of themselves without any of that puffiness. And different bodies react different ways. One supplement might work really well for this guy, and you give it to the same supplement to someone else, and they have a horrible reaction. We can't take those chances. And so for 25 years, we've had success doing it with natural food, sleep, and very specific and deliberate, correct exercise. Incredible, incredible. So Eric, I want to ask kind of a couple questions. I know we're running towards the end here. For so many people, I think the biggest issue out there is actually motivation. Do you have any ideas? I mean, obviously the people you work with are making millions of dollars to look the way that they look, but I'm sure they still want to cut corners. They still want to skip the day of training. So when the going gets tough, How can people motivate themselves to design this dream body that we've been talking about? Right. Well, I'll tell you where the motivation comes from. First of all, we should all always have something that we can look forward to in our lives. And if you find that you're living a life where you have nothing to look forward to, it means that you need to recalibrate, you know, and re-examine the things that matter to you. I mean, uh, whether it's a family get together or a graduation or a wedding or a big date or a goal of achieving a contest, whether it's a bodybuilding contest or a run, we should always have things that we're looking forward to. And so those things become a motivating factor when it comes to transforming your body and your life. The second thing is for many people, at least people that I meet outside of Los Angeles, I mean, we travel extensively, we're all over the place. A lot of people have never seen themselves in the best possible version. Even the cutest girl in a small town in Ohio might walk around at 85% of her potential. Mm -hmm. So if you go through our process and you get a glimpse of yourself in the high 90s, like have you ever seen yourself at 97% of where you could be potentially? I mean, if ask yourself a question. If Universal Studios or Warner Brothers sent you to me and said, you have 12 days to make this person into the person that's going to be on camera in Vancouver, what would I do to you and how would you look? 
is there a movie star version of you? I mean, if I say to you, close your eyes and imagine a basketball player, you can do that. And is that person tall? Of course. If I say to you, close your eyes and imagine a jockey in the Kentucky Derby, you can do that. You can imagine what that person looks like. Is that person short? Of course he is. Mm -hmm. Now, if I say to you, close your eyes and imagine a movie star, you're picturing a movie star in your mind. Is that person attractive? Of course. That person's attractive, confident, amazing. Now, superimpose yourself on that movie star. Imagine yourself now with those same qualities that that movie star had. I'm the guy that could get you there, and this is the method that we would take. And so it's kind of exciting to get to treat yourself, to get a glimpse of yourself as that realized version of who you are. It's not about making you look like anyone else. It's about taking the person that you are and making it fully realized. And it's exciting. You can do that just with exercise, diet, and sleep. Incredible. Incredible. So Eric, as we wrap up, two more questions. The second to last one being, if people want to learn more, they want to check you out, get in contact, stuff like that, where would you like us to send them? If they want to uh, be part of what the exercises and the transformation that we're doing, I would love for them to buy our book. It's on Amazon. It's called Hollywood Muscle, written by Eric the Trainer. If they want to work out with me directly, we have an online program called Get Hollywood Muscle, which is available. It's very, very low cost, and it's online streaming videos of me training people. It's actually, they're not workout videos. These are training videos. So this is the exact experience you would have if you worked out with me. And they're a lot of fun. We have hundreds of people that are on it now all over the place. That's called Get Hollywood Muscle. And uh, if they have any questions, they can contact me on Facebook, Eric the Trainer on Facebook, and uh, or they can go to my website, ericthetrainer.com. Brilliant, brilliant. So last question here, Eric, one we always like to close on. If people walk away from this episode and you know they haven't done the memory training with me, so they only remember one lesson, I know it's a tragic thing to think of, but what would you hope for that one lesson they remember to actually be? You know, the one lesson that I would want to give to your listeners is the lesson of prioritizing yourself. Because you can help others in the world and you can make the world a better place if you yourself become the best, most realized version of yourself. So I encourage your listeners to prioritize themselves, take good care of themselves, sleep well at night, drink lots of water during the day, eat healthy foods, smile at people, smile mm -hmm. at strangers, and, and allow yourself to sort of fully become that person that you need to be so you can be more effective helping others. Absolutely. And that's a brilliant brilliant takeaway to end on. Eric, the trainer, I want to thank you so much. It's been really such a pleasure and I learned quite a bit. I'm sure our audience did as well. And I definitely hope we keep in touch. I want to take you up on that offer next time I find myself in LA. That sounds great, man. Thank you again for having me on your show. I had a blast. An absolute pleasure. Take care, Eric. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, super friends, that's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.